Hey, uh, good morning, Vintage Church Durham. I'm really glad that you joined us today for our first ever live stream service. Um, I got to be honest with you, I'm feeling a mix of emotions as I'm standing in this room with just a few people. Um, sad that you're not here and I can see your faces, but I'm also really excited to take this step and to worship in person with friends and with family. And I'm really glad that you joined us. Just a quick note, um, we will be live streaming our services from now on at 10 a.m. on our Vintage Church Durham Facebook page. And we will also look to post the service in its entirety on our Vintage Church Durham YouTube page following this stream. Before we join together in worship, I want to take a brief moment to introduce Seth and Crystal Dady. <clears throat> I've gotten to know them over the last couple of weeks, um, and I'm just really excited to be led by them and to worship with them this morning and to get to know them. Seth has taken the opportunity to join our Vintage Church Durham staff team, and uh, man, I'm just really expectant uh, and hopeful for this season of being led by him for the next few weeks and months and hopefully years as we get to do this for a while. Uh, Vintage Church Durham, would you please extend uh, virtual hugs and handshakes to them this morning, and as you get to know them, let's just spoil them with as much Bean Traders coffee as we possibly can. <laughs> Today's call to worship comes to us from Psalm, excuse me, Psalm 145, verses 16 um, through 21. They read, you open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him and to all who call on him in truth. His, he fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Vintage Church Durham, wherever you are this morning, your house, your backyard, your car, let's make room this morning as we go before the Lord in worship to worship the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings as we lift our hands in worship to the one who is mighty to save. If you're anything like me and you're hurt and you need healing, you feel weak and you need strength, if you're excited and you want to worship, or if you're a sinner in need of a savior, Vintage Church Durham, we ask that you would join us in worship this morning, praising Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who is our friend of sinners and the savior of the universe. Vintage Church Durham, would you please stand if you're able and lift your hands and join us in worship, going to our Father through his Son, Jesus Christ, as we sing by the power of his Holy Spirit. Let's join in worship together. Father, we come before you this morning to worship you, to adore you, God. Lord, we lay all that we are at your feet. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come, that you would lead us this morning. Lord, you are worthy of our attention. You're worthy of our affection. So we worship you, God. We love you. We thank you. Would you be all that we see, all that we experience this morning? It's all about you, Jesus. We love you.
wishes I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, no ends always. Go and go on, be first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure. Father, we have come.
Think about that phrase. That all of heaven is singing the praise of the King of kings, the Lord of lords, gathered around his throne in exaltation. And it's always been and it will always be. We praise you, Jesus. You are holy. You are other. You are beautiful. We fix our eyes on you, Lord, because you are worthy of our praise. You are worthy. You are worthy, Lord. And we come into the holy presence of God. Our own humanity is laid bare. When we stand in the living presence of truth, our own falsehood is revealed. So people of God, let us acknowledge together who we are and ask our ever-present God and King to forgive us. Would you read this together as a corporate confession this morning as we worship the Lord? Let's read this. Jesus, you are the light of the world. You came to serve and to save. Your ways are humble and gentle. Yet we are stubborn people who cling to darkness. Our ways are often arrogant and harsh. We fail to love like you have loved us. We confess our lack of trust in you and return again now to your kindness. We return to the forgiveness you offer us through your sacrifice. Help us, Holy Spirit, to receive your committed love for us, that we may be filled with joy and empowered to love our neighbors in humility and kindness. Amen. Let's just spend a few moments now in silent confession to the Lord.
John 1, 9 through 13, says the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. Father, we thank you this morning for your forgiveness. We thank you that we can have assurance in who you are, that you will never change, that you will never forsake us, that you will never leave us. Thank you, Jesus, for your nearness through your spirit. Thank you for the gift of your spirit. Father, it's in your power that we rest today. It's in your power that we take delight today. We adore you, Jesus, and we worship you. We need you. We need you. Our land is broken. Our souls are broken. And so we just lay all that we have before you. Lord, we thank you for your nearness. our prayer this morning as we run out of words we know the one that intercedes for us has the words but we turn to him in our neediness in our brokenness in our desolation our hope is only in Jesus so we sing this together Lord, we don't know what to do. 
So we turn our eyes to you. We've run out of words to say. Would you come and have your way? You can save us from ourselves before our wounds hurt someone else. Lord, we need you. We need you now. Oh, Lord, we need you. We need you now. Let's sing that again. Because, Lord, we don't know what to do. So we turn our eyes to you. We've run out of words to say. But would you come and have your way? You can save us from ourselves before our wounds hurt someone else. Because, Lord, we need you. We need you now. Oh, Lord, we need you. We need you now. 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 We need your healing. We need you now. We need your healing, Jesus. We need your healing. We need your healing. We need you now. That is our prayer. Father, we need you. We love you, we adore you, we worship you. Would you come, Holy Spirit, and teach us, Lord, by your word that is living, is active. Lord, may we experience you, your power, your resurrection. Lord, we come not to, to muster up more of our humanity, to try to hype ourselves up, but to humble ourselves before you as the living God. Lord, may we experience your resurrection power. As your people, we do need you, Father. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Job chapter 1, verses 13 through 22 reads this. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground in worship. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. The word of the Lord.
to be gathering with you in real time. I can't tell you personally how grateful I am to not be standing in my living room in front of a camera, running behind it, pressing record, uh, doing all of that, uh, imagining even the presence of uh, the few folks who are here right now uh, who are volunteering and serving in order to make this live stream go is just so invigorating to me. Uh, and, I, and I do want to take a second and, and thank them. Thank you guys so much for, for serving uh, your church in this way. I'm, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, this also gives me hope for the fact that uh, soon we'll be able to do this with more than just the six of us in this room. But that we'll be able to, to all gather together uh, in this. Uh, Vintage Church, as you know, is a church that is for doubters and for seekers and for followers of Jesus. And whichever category you find yourself in, doubter, seeker, or follower, this series, Walking Wounded, is for you. Uh, look, uh, we've, we're still getting all the technical stuff together. There's a bumper video that you can check out on Vintage's Facebook or Instagram, and you can see the, the bumper video of the, the brother walking wounded and, and reminding us that this is the life that we lead. But that's what this series is. We're in part two of walking wounded, and we're looking through the book of Job. We're flying over Job at an incredible rate to see what God has to tell us about suffering, to see what God has to show us about how it is that we suffer. And here's what I mean when I say that regardless of where you are in that journey, in your journey of faith, Job is a book for you. Uh, the fact is that suffering is one of the few things in the world that does not discriminate that does not care about your religion, about your social status, about your nationality, about your gender, about your orientation, any of those things, any of those realities that are a part of who you are, suffering still comes, right? There's a saying that the only thing that's common to all people is death and taxes. Maybe you've heard that. But the fact is, suffering is common to all people, all of us will at some point in our life come to loss, pain, and suffering. And the book of Job speaks to us. And so last week, we looked at the fact that suffering, and really the book of Job, it, it, it invokes in us, it, it wells up in us some really deep existential and spiritual questions. Questions about who God is and what's going on in all of this. In fact, Satan, the accuser last week, uh, he comes to God with the accusation that you're not as good as you said you were. That you're not as good as, as people believe you to be. And in fact, the very crown jewel of all that you've done, creation and your people, even they're not good. And if you will just, if you will just allow suffering to come into the world, people will see that you're not good. One of the difficult things and one of the beautiful things about the book of Job, as we're going to come to find out, is that it offers no reason for why God allows the accuser to, to, to tempt and to suffer or to cause suffering uh, to Job, to afflict Job. In fact, it offers no real reason for the existence of suffering at all. Now, you're saying that's what we want to know. Like, if God is good and if God is powerful, why do good people suffer? And Job, instead, this book, this exploration, is going to continue to teach us that the fact of the matter is that people suffer because the world is broken. And as of yet, it is not designed to, to shield us, to protect us, to avoid suffering. Things are broken. Good people suffer. Right? And, and this is another thing that I love about Job because, listen, I'm, I'm a part of this tribe. I'm, I'm, I'm part of the Acts 29 Reformed tribe, and so I get it. There are no good people. Right? But, but here's the fact is Job doesn't start with that. Job isn't like, Job was a really good man, righteous and true, but man, he had this habit that he couldn't kick. Or this hidden sin that you didn't know about, right? Job starts out and it says he is righteous and right standing upright before the Lord. And not only, 
Does the, the author of this, uh, of this story tell us that? God himself, in talking to Satan, the accuser, says that of Job. So, so we, you, can, right, like you can miss me with the notion that Job is suffering because of some sin that he committed. We're actually going to see that in the future. I'm, I'm getting weeks ahead of myself now, but that's all right. I love that about this book. Instead, Job allows us to take seriously the question of suffering, without pointing fingers, but rather with the shaping of heart. Job teaches us what suffering does to us and what suffering shows us about God. Now, as we continue to, to talk through Job, as we continue to walk through it, uh, even the verses that we read can be really difficult for us because we have this learned habit I've seen. Uh, I used to think it was just me, but then you, you talk to more and more people. And we have this learned habit of, of dealing with suffering through what, I, what I'll call comparative analytical suffering. Here's what I mean by comparative analytical suffering. One of the ways that we avoid actually dealing with suffering is that we compare it to other people's suffering. And almost always, most people I know will always find someone whose suffering is worse and use that as a reason to say, oh, it's not that bad. I lost my job. Man, sister, I'm so sorry that you lost your job. It's okay. You know, I had a job. Some people didn't. Some people don't have food. Right, And we look at that, and there's sort of this like humility in that that, that almost seems like admirable. And, and, and I get it. We can always look and see somebody whose situation is worse. But let's follow that logic all the way through. That means that at any given point, there's only one person who gets to confront their suffering, really. And, and how do we even quantify that? Like, let's forget that task of figuring out who is the person who nobody else suffers worse than so that they can say, whew, suffering is hard. That doesn't work, and that's not what the gospel calls us to. God calls us to acknowledge our suffering, to be real and honest about our suffering. You know, it's interesting, as I was reading this passage in Job, my mind went to Karl Marx. And I know some of you are like, whoa, slow down, right? Especially in today's climate, don't worry. My mind went to Karl Marx because there's, there's a very popular uh, quote attributed to Karl Marx. And, and you may have heard it. It's that religion is the opiate of the masses. You've heard that? Right, well, so here's the thing about that is it's actually not the full quote. Right, Marx is talking about oppression and suffering and religion's role in it. And what he says is religious suffering is, at the same time, the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Listen to this next phrase. And, and before, just listen. He says, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless condition." It is the opium of the people. So, so now hear what Marx is saying. And, and maybe this is how you understood it before. Uh, rather than like religion makes people dumb, what Marx is saying is people have real problems. And religion is like when you go to the hospital and there's a real problem and they've said there's nothing we can do about it. Let's keep him or her comfortable. Religion is that final thing that men and women, that society has created for itself. And when Marx talks religion, he's talking about Christianity. There are other religions, obviously, but that's the one that he is reacting most heavily to. And so he says religion, religious suffering, Christian suffering, acknowledges the reality of suffering, but it offers no real material uh, understanding and solution to it, so it simply numbs you. Now, I would say in this moment that Marx is both correct and wrong. At the same time, he's correct. And this is what I love. We talked about this last week. This is what I love about Christianity and about the Christian faith and about the scriptures. The scriptures do not hide suffering, right? Job loses his family and, and the summation isn't and Job loses all of his stuff 
And the summation isn't, well, somebody else never had stuff, Job. And the Job is like, well, that is a great point. It's better to have loved and lost than to never have loved at all. And he moves on. It doesn't, Job's suffering is real. And Job's response to his suffering is true, as we're going to see. It doesn't fly over suffering, right? We take hardship real. In fact, the scripture more than just takes it real, promises it. When I say that each of us will experience suffering, that's not like, oh, I've observed the world and I'm an old wise sage and here's what I've learned. That's the Bible. If you follow Jesus, you're going to experience suffering. If you are born into this broken world, you're going to experience pain and loss. So what do we do with that? First of all, we acknowledge the pain and the loss because it tells us something true. And here is the true thing that I want you to explore today. What I want you to see is that the true thing that pain and and that grief of suffering tells us is that you had and there are good things. Things that are worth grieving. Things that are worth feeling the pain over their loss. Listen to what the scriptures say about Job. Let, let's, let's start in the beginning again in, in that first part of chapter 1 and then let's, let's go and examine what, what Crystal read for us. It says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Now listen, there were born to him seven sons and three daughters. Now uh, in this story and if you understand sort of how ancient Near Eastern folks tell stories, Numbers mattered. And so the notion that he has seven, which is like a number of completion, and I'm not going to go into like numerical, don't worry, I'm not that guy. But seven sons and then three daughters, so ten children in total. What that means is he has all of the sons that a man could ever want or need to to send his lineage on to, to work and to grow his dynasty, as it were. And the fact that he had 10 children total meant he had all the children. His life, when it comes to family and to offspring, was full. He had all the children you could ever want, sons and daughters. Now again, listen to this. He possessed 7,000 sheep, so there's that seven, and 3,000 camels, that three, right? So again, now you put that together, what do you get? Math, right? But you get 10,000. So again, all that a man could need. If you think about an agrarian culture, to have that much livestock meant that you were doing well. In fact, it says he was doing better than anyone around him, and everyone knew it. He had 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. We aren't even numbering the servants that Job has so that this man Job was the greatest of all the people in the east. Now, all of these things that Job has are good things. Job has children. And over and over again, we're, we're told like, to, to avoid idolatry, and I agree with that. Idolatry is taking something that's good and making it ultimate, even higher than God. That's bad. But on the other end, what we don't want to do is take something that's good, decidedly good, and make it like okay because we're afraid of, of falling off the idolatry end. Instead, we ought to recognize that these things are good. Children offspring, family are good, right? Uh, A job, financial security, the ability to provide for your offspring and for yourself to eat and to enjoy eating. In fact, as our story that we're reading now begins in verse 13, as Crystal read, there was a day when the sons and daughters were eating drink and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Another way that that reads is that they were having a feast. The ability to feast is good. The ability to enjoy what God has given you is good. Right? He has, he has dominion and dynasty is what Job has. So dominion, he owns all this stuff. Dynasty, he has children and offspring that God has given him. These things are good. And, and everyone, including God and the accuser, acknowledge the inherent goodness of these things. 
So the absence of these in our lives or the loss, as we'll see in Job's life, is bad and painful. It says there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house and there came a messenger to Job and then messenger after messenger after messenger comes. Hey, I was just here. It was bad. Broke out. You lost everything except me. Hey, I was here. It was bad. Broke out. You lost everything except me. Right? Like, and four times, and he's lost all the sheep, all the donkeys, all the oxen, all the camel, all his children, everything. Everything. Except four servants. Right? This is bad. This is beyond bad. This is inconceivably just horrific. This is tragic. And this is Job's experience. This is what we see Job dealing with. And in this, what we begin to see is some truths about the good things that God gives us. And I want us to see some of those truths. Like the first thing is the gifts that God gives us, they are good. We've already explored that. We've already stated that. It is true. God calls these things good. They're also grace. Every single one of those things that Job had was the grace of God. Here's how we see it, and Job's going to explore it later, but here's how we see it. They all get taken away, and it takes, it takes God's approval. Now, that can well up in us some stuff about God, and we're going to deal with that throughout this book. But for now, just understand this, that everything that Job had was a gift from God. And the same is true for you. Your very breath in your lungs, your family, your job, any good thing that you would know. In fact, let's take a minute. Take a second. And just, just count for a second in your head all of the things, even in the midst of the pandemic that you have that are good. Name them. Picture them in your head. When you see that face, it's a gift from God. When you think about that job or that meal or, or just that joy that you have, your favorite TV show, gifts from God. Every good thing comes from the giver of good things, God himself. And so we see that they are all gifts of grace, which means that it's not Job's righteousness that earned them for him, but rather God's gracious love and sovereign choice. What that means when we recognize that every good thing is a gift, it means conversely that suffering is not always punishment. We don't live in a world that is a meritocracy. And we need to hear this, brothers and sisters, so that we can be gracious to ourselves in the midst of our suffering, so that we can be humble in the midst of our prosperity, and so that when we look at our, our neighbors and when we look at cultures and communities and people who are suffering, who have nothing, or who have uh, pain and sorrow, that we look at misery and we don't say, here's the deficiency that caused it, but rather recognize that God has given us gifts graciously and that we may be the gracious gift that God intends for someone else. That, that one's for free. That's not where I meant to go, but that's where, that's where it leads. Every gift is gracious. We do not earn it. Everything you have is from the hand of God. And here's the third thing that we see. Everything that we have is fleeting. It fades. No amount of money, no amount of uh, property, no, no job, no person that you know will be here with you in 200 years. For most of you, a hundred years. It's all fleeting. It's all fading away. Not only is your life a breath, but all of those things. And even the things that you have, if they outlive you, there's no good gift from God that goes to the grave with you. There is no good gift from God that goes to the grave with you. And so Job sees that, he realizes that in a moment, in four moments when it just comes and it pours and, it, and, and he is overwhelmed with grief. 
You see, we have to recognize the nature of the gifts that we have. If we are to ever not walk around, not deflect, not ignore our suffering, but as Christianity calls us to, to walk through it. You remember that quote, uh, Marx is saying Christianity can acknowledge suffering, Christianity can give like a little pain relief to the suffering, but it doesn't teach us how to move through suffering. In fact, it does. The book of Job, uh, right here in the very beginning, Job's life, Job's reaction tells us how we walk through it. And it's funny, it's also the bomb, but it is, it is the cure, it's the way through. And the only way to do it is to walk through suffering and worship worship. Listen to what happens. It says, Job hears all of these things. Then he arose. I get it. Like some of us may sit down, some of us stand. He arose. He tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground. All of these things make sense. And then the next phrase, partially because of how we think of worship, doesn't seem to, but it does. It says, and then he worshiped. Worship is the gift that God gives us, not just for joyous times to thank him and to celebrate. Worship is the good gift that God gives his people so that they can walk through anything. Worship is the song that leads us through suffering. The fact is when we cease to worship, when we fail to see worship as the central means of navigating suffering, we always hear our own tune. And our tune will try and lead us around it. Our tune will try and just have us turn away and walk away from it. Uh, And it makes me think of, uh, I have kids, I can't help it with this. Uh, There was a song that my oldest used to love and it was like, we're going on a bear hunt. You know, and then look over there and it's, it's a swamp. You can't go over it, you can't go under it, you can't go around it. What other way is there? We gotta go through it. And worship is the song that leads us through the suffering. And I want us to see some aspects of Job's worship that can guide us as we understand worship in the midst of suffering. Another name for suffering worship is lament. Let's hear and see Job's lament. I'm going to read it all to you and then we're going to just look at a few things. The verse is this. uh, Well, let's read it first. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshiped. And he said, naked, I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gives, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then in this it says, Job didn't sin or falsely accuse God of anything. So let's look at the nature of Job's worship that guided him through suffering. And we'll we'll see why religion isn't the opiate, why Christianity, why faith in Jesus, faith in God is not the opiate, but rather the cure. The first thing that we see about worship in suffering, particularly Job's, but for all of us, is that it is authentic. Now that word authentic, it's used a lot. It's one of our core values. Uh, But in this case, what I mean is it's integrated. It's fully integrated. Uh, His body, his mind, his spirit, they all match. Look at the posture of Job's worship. First of all, Job is suffering, and so he he doesn't put on his Sunday best. It doesn't say Job got into his altar best, raised his hands, and had that big smile that you can see on a billboard, right? No, Job tore his clothes, shaved his head, fell naked on the ground, and worshiped. So that's his posture. Job is naked, shaved, on the ground, and his worship's content matches his posture. What does he say? Naked, I came from my mother's womb. Naked, I shall return to the earth. And his posture, I almost see Job in the fetal position. And I know that some of you feel like being in the fetal position. Right now, all the time. I want you to know that in the fetal position, God, as the scriptures say, like a mother draws a child to her bosom, God draws you when you're in the fetal position and on the ground into himself. 
And so Job's in the fetal position, talking about being naked coming out of the womb, having shaved his head. His posture matches the reality of the situation. There's integration in his life. Listen, your emotions are a good gift from God. And that intensity that sometimes we want to mute because it feels faithless is actually a really faithful response. Crying out in anger, crying out in grief, tears streaming down, collapsing on the floor. These are obedient, faithful practices because when you collapse to the floor, you are in faith saying that the God of the universe will catch me or pick me up. That's why God commands his people to tear their clothes, to mourn and to grieve and to wail for days on end. Our worship and our posture, our lives have to match. Worship should be authentic. It should come from the true space where you are. Are you a doubter? Worship God with bringing your doubts to God. Are you seeking after God? Worship God like somebody who doesn't know where the next step is going to lead. Because here's the truth is we don't know. You following Jesus? Worship God with the confidence of one who knows his shepherd, the great shepherd, will lead you through suffering into joy. It's authentic worship. But then also, it's true. Everything that Job says in his worship is true. There's no, no pain can hurt me, nothing can, right? And I know the scriptures say no weapon formed against me shall prosper. It doesn't say no weapon formed against me shall sting. Right? It doesn't say no weapon formed against me shall touch me. It means it will not prosper. In the end, we will get through because God will carry us through. And so we speak true things in worship. And Job says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. Job speaks the truth of all of our plights. Suffering in part is rooted in the fact that we are temporal people, and the things that we love are temporal. They are passing away. And so Job speaks that truth about himself. He speaks that truth about us. Then in his worship, he speaks the truth about God. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. God is sovereign over all of my suffering. Right? For some of you, this can, as we said before, this can feel like, well, wait, what is God doing? But for a second, think about it in this way. If God is sovereign over all of your suffering, that means that in this very moment, as Job cries out from his pit, God is in the pit there to hear him. God is sovereign over your suffering, which means God is present in it. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. He is sovereign. He is still good. So Job's worship is authentic. Job's worship is truthful. And Job's worship is Godward. It is pointed towards God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, this can feel it really can feel like it's, uh, there's tension here, ironic. It doesn't make sense, and yet it does. Because what happens when you, like Job, recognize that the giver of the gift is better even than the gift itself. When you recognize that the giver of the gift is truer and more lasting even than the gift itself, it allows you both to enjoy the beauty and the wonder of the gift. Family, enjoy the gifts that God gives you. But also, to rely and to trust in and to worship and to praise God, to lament to God when those gifts fade or are taken. And Job does this. And ultimately, it reminds us that all of these things have an eschatological end. They're pointing to something that God is doing. Listen to uh, how it started again. Verse 13, one more time. There was a day when his sons and daughters were eating, drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. They were having a feast. And feasts are what God has designed us for. Right? It's why every culture has food and drink that they just love. And when you go, they're like, yo, you have to check out this. It's like, all right, let's do it, right? Because God has created us to feast together, and that is where this is all headed. There's a feast coming. If we get to the end of Job 
God restores Job and everything to Job. That may not happen in our lifetime, but there's a feast. And the, the book of Job has this trajectory where the real physical suffering that we have is just only, it's only the beginning. Paul says it this way, that our light momentary suffering is forging for us a weight of glory. Uh, that if we're crucified with Christ in suffering, if we share in his sufferings, we will share in his glory. And what that means for us is that suffering is the path to joy and to feasting with God. And that's where this is going. So if you're a doubter and you're suffering, in this moment, take your doubts, your frustrations, your suffering. Fall before God. Watch him catch you and carry you to the feast that he has prepared for you. And if you're a follower, keep following. Keep walking through the doubt. And whoever you are, let that walk, let the soundtrack of your walk through suffering be worship. Authentic, truthful, Godward worship. And he'll carry you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for Job. We're grateful that this story of suffering can speak into the suffering that we may be experiencing in this moment. God, we pray. We pray that you would give us strength to not only endure suffering, uh, but to walk wounded through it. And God, we recognize that sometimes that means you're going to have to carry us. And so like Job, we collapse on the floor before you we cry out, oh God, you never leave our side. We say thank you. We bless your name. Turn our suffering to joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, each week when we gather together and we rehearse the gospel in song and we hear the gospel through the word, uh, we are called to respond to the gospel. And there are a few ways that we do that as a church. Uh, the first way that we do that is through uh, communion. And what I love about communion, especially in the midst of suffering, is that communion, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and said, this is my body, broken for you. I'm going to suffer. And in the same manner, he took the cup and poured it out. And he said, and, uh, this is my blood shed for you the blood of a new covenant and then he commands us to eat and drink each time we gather together a little mini feast because the suffering of Christ shared by the suffering of his people leads to the feast of heaven so if you have the elements the bread and the wine take and remember be thankful another way that we respond is through prayer we want to pray for you so if you would, reach out to us with your request. If you're suffering, God has called your family to be balm to your wounds. To, to, as I heard one brother say a few years ago, and I was so moved by it, to feed joy to you if you can't feed yourself. To feed faith to you if you can't. Reach out to us. Let us pray for you. Let us be with you. And then the final way that we respond is just like Job. We fall down broken before our God. And we cry out in worship. So let's worship together. In the valley, oh God, you're near. In the quiet, oh God, you're near. In the shadow, oh God, you're near. At my breaking, oh God, you're near. You're near, oh God. You'll never. In my searching, oh God, you're near. 
We close at our time. We're going to teach you a new song. It's called uh, Joy. And really just allowing worship to be our protest uh, against despair, which is what we just talked about as we dig into the word of God, uh, that we would grab hold of the joy that God offers us as just a state of being that we can uh, worship him even in our grief, even in our sorrow. So let's sing this together. There's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love instead of pain. There's freedom, though you've captured me. I've got joy instead of mourning. He gives us joy in the deepest parts of our soul. Sing this together.
been the worshiping church gathered. So now go as the worshiping church scattered. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever 
and ever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.